You're listening to Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial. I'm Louise Ma. We do not know this Australian's name, and we never will. We do not know his rank or his battalion. We do not know where he was born or precisely how and when he died. He was someone's son, perhaps someone's brother or father, certainly someone's mate. And now he lies here forevermore in the tomb of the unknown Australian soldier, in the Hall of Memory, the heart of the Australian War Memorial. I'm here with military historian Craig Tibbetts. The idea for Unknown Soldiers came really during the First World War. The British um, chaplain, Reverend David Railton, came up with the idea to have an unknown warrior buried in Great Britain. And that actually happened in 1920, Remembrance Day 1920. And simultaneously, the French buried an unknown warrior underneath the Arc de Triomphe. Soon after that, there was discussions and calls for the same thing to occur here in Australia. But there was some opposition to that because there was plans for the War Memorial to fill that role, the future War Memorial, which was to be built here. And there was also some feeling that the Unknown Warrior buried in Westminster Abbey in London would represent all British Empire and Dominion soldiers. So it was was initially sort of knocked on the head fairly early, but then calls for for an unknown Australian soldier perpetuated and then in the 19 early 1990s the decision was made that we would bring one home. Was the original idea to have one soldier representing many or was it an acknowledgement that so many men died in unmarked graves or was it a bit of both? I, I, I think it's both really. Yes it's it's uh, the unknown soldier is really meant to symbolise all who served and died, but particularly those that have no known grave. And of the um, just over 60,000 Australians that died in the First World War, about one third of them, their either remains were never recovered or remains were recovered, but they're not identifiable. So about one third, so it's quite a significant lot. And the other factor too, particularly with Australia, is that nearly all all of those that died during the war are buried overseas in you know, France, Gallipoli, Egypt, various places, Belgium. And so for most Australian families, that was out of the question to make the journey to go and visit a, a grave, certainly in the decades after the First World War. The calls for an Australian soldier to be brought home continued on and off through the 20th century. After a campaign by the War Memorial, those calls were finally answered by the then government of Paul Keating. The repatriation in 1993 marked the 75th anniversary of the end of the First World War. And then once the decision was made, they acted on it fairly quickly. They they went to uh, the Adelaide Commonwealth War Cemetery, which is just on the outskirts of Villa Bretonneau, a very uh, famous location for Australian battle in 1918. And um, I think around at that time there was almost 1,000 graves there. Um, Actually, it might have been about 600 and and 300 who were unidentified and chose one that was chosen by random, uh, um, uh, an Australian. They know it was an Australian just by the uniform and and, uh, identifying things, but they have no idea who it was. And so um, it was chosen, brought back. That was just a... Uh, very early November 1993, brought back, laid in state in uh, King's Hall and the old Parliament House for, I think, four days. And then it really became both a funeral procession as the coffin was brought up, Anzac Parade, and then brought up here and laid to rest. The remains of the unknown soldier were in a Tasmanian Blackwood coffin and laid over the top of that. There was a sprig of wattle a bayonet, and there was also an old digger, First World War soldier, 
who sprinkled some soil from the battlefield of Pozieres atop the coffin uh, before that uh, red marble slab was laid over the top. The red marble slab is inscribed with words in gold. An unknown Australian soldier killed in the war of 1914-1918. The tomb is set in black granite, representing the earth. A sloping marble border raises it slightly above the floor. A scattering of crimson poppies adorns the surface. The Hall of Memory, with its mosaic walls, high domed ceiling and impressive stained glass windows, is part of the memorial's commemorative area. You reach it by walking through the central stone courtyard, passing by the Pool of Reflection and the Eternal Flame, flanked on either side by the arched cloisters where the names of the dead are inscribed in bronze. This commemorative area evolved in stages over more than half a century. Craig Tibbetts says the tomb is the culmination of that work. It completes the entire commemorative area and it's the focal point of a very solemn commemoration here inside the Hall of Memory. Um, Over 50 years, various elements have been added to the commemorative area. When it opened in 1941, Um, A lot of this wasn't here. The stained glass windows weren't added till 1950. The Hall of Memory itself wasn't opened till 59. What's important also is the uh, uh, the pool was there, the pool of reflection, but the eternal flame, that wasn't added until 1988, and that ties in very much with, you know, the role of honour. That that was added in the 1960s, the eternal flame, and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, It's really all about remembering the dead, perpetual commemoration and eternal gratitude and never forgetting, particularly those that lost their lives and especially those that had no known grave. As um, was said in Paul Keating's eulogy, he is all of them and he is one of us. It's inscribed on the plinth there right before us. We will never know who this Australian was. Yet he has always been among those we've honoured. We do know that he was one of the 45,000 Australians who died on the Western Front, one of the 416,000 Australians who volunteered for service in the First World War, one of the 324,000 Australians who served overseas in that war, and one of the 60,000 Australians who died on foreign soil, one of the 100,000 Australians who have died in wars this century. He is all of them, and he's one of us. You're listening to Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial. I'm Louise Ma. We undertake regular monitoring and cleaning of the tomb, so it gets checked every couple of days uh, and cleaned once to three times a week. Jackie Jordan is the memorial's preventive conservation officer. It's her job to help staff and visitors avoid damaging any part of the memorial's collection. So when we're checking the tomb, we're checking the number of poppies that are on the surface. So we encourage visitors to place poppies as a sign of their support uh, and recognition of that sacrifice. But we also want to be able to see the tomb and uh, have the gilded lettering legible. So that's something that we monitor. We also check for any contaminants or debris and dirt and when we notice a build-up of that we start to clean it. Usually that involves using soft uh, microfiber sweeper, microfiber cloths and also soft brushes to brush out the lettering because the gilding is quite fragile and we need to be careful with that, with how we clean that. A few years back a new ritual was introduced. Every now and then, certain dignitaries, including MPs and senators, are invited to clean the tomb themselves in private. 
In 2019, that privilege was extended to Australia's Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. When he arrived on the day, we met in the tomb and he was part of a solitary several moments so that he could appreciate the sacred nature of the Hall of Memory as a whole and then pay his respects to the Tomb of the Unknown Australian Soldier. Then as part of that ceremony, he undertook a cleaning of the tomb. So similar procedure as I uh, mentioned previously, inspecting for any dirt and debris, uh, using soft cloth to remove any of that material, uh, and then using a soft brush to carefully clean out any um, dirt or debris from the gilded lettering on the stone. Jackie, you've seen any number of dignitaries, famous people, important people, VIPs, whatever, come here and have that solitary time in the tomb and that honour of being the one to clean the tomb. What do you think is the effect on them? It can vary, but almost always it's extremely powerful. The space gives you a sense of awe and uh, a real feeling of the atmosphere around commemoration. Uh, so when they have the opportunity to undertake that act of service to the Tomb of the Unknown Australian Soldier, that really drives home for them the need for us to come together and commemorate these significant memorials. So what's it like for you yourself to have the job of caring for this precious place? It's quite extraordinary really and I am honoured to have the opportunity to be one in a long line of caretakers for the tomb. It's quite extraordinary to have the opportunity to come into the space by myself and with my team as well. You really do get a sense of that awe and immense echoing silence. Yeah, it is an echoing silence, isn't it? Yes, that's right. I think it really instills in you that moment of awe and full appreciation for all of the commemoration that is represented in this memorial here. Do you sometimes wonder who it is exactly who's lying in that tomb? Of course. Yeah, I think we all do. But the purpose is that it could be any one person, any one person who contributed and in that way as Australians, no matter who we are, where we come from, we can all relate to that. So I try not to think of figuring out who that individual is because they do represent all of us. Though Jackie quite correctly talks about the echoing silence of this place, the silence is sometimes broken by the sound of flapping wings. <laughs> that was a pigeon that just went past, right? Yes. <laughs> They're very busy. The doors of the Hall of Memory are open to the courtyard and the cloisters, where visitors leave crimson poppies next to the names of the fallen. Pigeons fly in and out, and in 2019, one stayed. Historian Dr Malia Hampton has the story. Yes, uh, the Hall of Memory and um, the cloisters here have a side of um, lots of people leaving poppies of remembrance and in 2019 we had a very enterprising pigeon who came in and collected a whole bunch of them and made a nest for itself in the anti-pigeon spikes inside our, um, uh, in the stained glass windows inside the Hall of Memories. So there was a pigeon living in the Hall of Memory? Living and having babies. It had this great big red poppy nest and that sort of sat right up on the spikes. So it was a really big luxurious thing and had its babies in there. So the spikes were there to stop the pigeons but this pigeon was so enterprising that it got around that impediment. Yeah the poppies are made out of wire and fabric and so they've got quite a bit of um, I don't know like structural structure to them so he could use the wire she could use the wire to build this nest that could like weave its way through these other spikes and, and create quite a soft spot for it. This is quite symbolic in a way too because pigeons actually played quite a role in war, particularly in the First World War. They did. We've got a long history of using animals in warfare to do the things we can't do and one of the things we've had a lot of trouble 
being able to do technologically is communicate over distance. So now it's easy for us to get out our recording equipment or our phones, but in um, the First World War and before, there's a lot of trouble communicating over long distances and pigeons were one way of getting past that. And they've been very useful. One of the interesting stories is that they were actually in use widely in the Second World War as well, which is a war we think of as being quite modern and using wireless technology and lots of extra communicative devices. But um, in the islands in particular, for the Australians, we couldn't communicate using um, normal wireless. The humidity and the mountains interfered with it. And so we created a pigeon service that um, worked very widely in the, in the signals core to get messages around. What was the reaction of staff here at the War Memorial when they discovered this pigeon was building a nest from the commemorative poppies? Well, it caused a bit of a kerfuffle and everyone was super interested to see it. But um, And our director at the time was really excited to see it because it's lovely. It's like new life over death and all of those sorts of things. And um, yeah, so we were all really interested to see it. Our staff writer wrote a piece on it and um, that then went viral. So the world has been very interested to see it as well. And what's been the fate of the pigeon and its family? Well, she was allowed to raise her family and they have since flown the nest and it's been cleaned up because um, we were having to clean up after the birds every hour to make sure the place stayed hygienic and appropriately sombre and we're not encouraging her to come back. But certainly um, we rewarded her for her time and patience at the time. (laughs) It was a lovely one-off story. Yeah, it was. Poppies are really linked to our last unknown soldier as well because, you know, know, they, they are lying on top of his tomb and they're all along the name panels that we've got in our cloisters. That happened when people were waiting to file past this tomb with their poppies to put on here, started putting it in the panels. So that act of having so many poppies around dates back to that same day that we buried our unknown soldier here and the pigeon is just taking advantage of that years and years later. Okay, so people didn't put the poppies next to the names before the arrival of the unknown soldier. Yeah, it was this iconic day where we hadn't had queues like that up and down the cloisters ever and um, while they were waiting they started doing it nobody knows who started but by the end of the day there were quite a few and now it's a tradition for 20 odd years. And what a tradition the placing of the poppies has become. Before we leave the Hall of Memory and the tomb of the unknown Australian soldier a final word from the tomb's caretaker Jackie Jordan. My role is conservation of this memorial and usually we think of that in terms of conserving the physical fabric which we do through our maintenance programs but conservation is also about maintaining memory and understanding in people's minds um, and as a community so That's why our ceremonial cleaning as well as the wreath laying is so important to the overall conservation of this memorial in its place in the Hall of Memory. We've lost more than 100,000 lives and with them all their love of this country and all their hope and energy. But we've gained a legend, a story of bravery and sacrifice and with it a deeper faith in ourselves and our democracy and a deeper understanding of what it means to be Australian. It's not too much to hope, therefore, that this unknown Australian soldier might continue to serve his country. He might enshrine a nation's love of peace and remind us that in the sacrifice of the men and women whose names are recorded here, there is faith enough for all of us. Thanks for listening to this episode of Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial. I'm Louise Ma. You can subscribe to the series by going to the memorial's website or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time.